Hello, my name is Liz and I work for Museums Northumberland as part of the RPAS Your Future project. As part of this project, we want to share some of the cool history of Newcastle, North Tyneside and Northumberland with you. And we also want to show you some cool careers that there are available locally as well. Later on, we'll have a special guest who will be answering some questions sent in by school children across the region. In today's assembly, we're going to be meeting George Bracegirdle, a veterinary surgeon. Before we meet George, we're going to be finding out about some other careers. And a really interesting sector to work in is the life sciences sector. And what are the life sciences? They're the study of living things, animals, plants and other organisms. And today we're going to be thinking specifically about some careers that involve animals. Our first career is an ecologist. Ecologists study the relationship between organisms, so plants, animals and other living things, and the environment. They need to be curious and observant when studying an area to see which living things are there how they interact with each other and how the environment affects them. Ecologists need to be good communicators as they're often asked to report on how human behaviour might impact an area and the things living in it. As well as going to areas and surveying them, ecologists might use coding to create computer models of food webs, simulations of environments to see how things might change over time, or what would happen if something new was introduced. You can have a go at ecology by looking at different habitats, maybe in your garden or at the beach, to see what you can find living in them. Scientists are often looking for people to report what they've spotted, especially things like bees, birds, ladybirds, moths and butterflies. And you can have a look online to find out where to report these if you want to try some ecology for yourself. Our next career are habitat restoration engineers and they are landscape planners working from an ecological perspective. That means that they're committed to thinking about the environment and wildlife in their work. They look at how human actions and natural events change landscapes and how they affect the things living there. They're hardworking and spend a lot of time working out the best way to restore a landscape to its former state. This picture shows an open cast coal mine. The landscape has been completely changed while the coal is extracted and it needs restoring afterwards. The next picture shows an area near Druridge Bay in Northumberland. This used to be an open cast coal mine, but now the land's been restored and it's been turned into a nature reserve. And it's quite a transformation. Our last career is that of a marine biologist. Marine biologists study things that live in the oceans. They might choose to specialise in researching one particular species. For example, they might be a whale monitor, or they might look at a whole ecosystem, such as a coral reef. They need to be observant to look out for different species and behaviours. If they work for an offshore industry, they might look at the effects of overfishing, shipping, or the construction of wind turbines or other structures, and how these might affect ocean life. It might be tricky to work out the effects of these, so they need to be tenacious and stick with it until they've worked out the answer. A lot of marine biologists' work involves research, observation and data collection, so they need to be organised too. There are lots of career opportunities in our region that involve the natural world, and we also have an interesting heritage of people studying this too. You might have heard of the Great North Museum, but it was once called the Hancock Museum after John Hancock and his brother Albany. They both studied natural history and they also raised money for the construction of the museum in 1884. John is considered the father of modern taxidermy. You can see some of his collection of birds at the Great North Museum in the Natural Northumbria Gallery. Another important person was Marie Labour, who was born in Woodburn, Northumberland in 1876. She spent a lot of time studying the natural world and she studied at what was then Durham University in Newcastle. Later in her life, she lived in Leeds and then Plymouth, where she worked for the Marine Biological Association. She studied lots of different things in her career, including cockles, krill, and she discovered 28 species of microplankton, which are tiny organisms that live in the water. She published books nearly a hundred years ago and they're still used today. Here you can see her on a trip to Bermuda to study crustacean larvae 
and she would probably have gone on more trips if World War II hadn't stopped her being able to travel abroad. We've had a look at quite a few different careers involving animals, and now we're going to meet our special guest. So today's special guest is George Bracegirdle, and he's going to be answering some of the questions that you've sent in about being a vet. Hello there, nice to be here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello. Um, so we've got lots of questions that have been sent in um, by young people around our area. Um, and the first one is, what made you want to be a vet and have you always wanted to be one? So um, these three photos, um, I think, summarise this pretty well for me. Um, so yes, um, the simple answer to have I always wanted to be a vet, that, the answer to that is yes, I have. Um, and the reason that I want to be a vet is because Quite simply, I love animals. I love all of my pets. Um, these are all pictures of my own animals at the moment. Um, so that's my cat there. Uh, her name is Cloudy. And then my two dogs, they're called Rosie and Hilda. And then uh, that's my chicken. Um, sadly, no longer no longer with us, but her name is Bunty. Um, but uh, yes, I've always wanted to be a vet because I've always loved animals and I've always loved science as well. So being a vet was the perfect combination of those two things. Cool. OK, and then the next question was, what do you need to do to become a vet and how long did it take you to train? So um, to to become a vet, you need to um, do quite well at school. Um, obviously, you need to do primary school, secondary school, GCSEs and then A levels. At A level, I had to do uh, biology and chemistry and then other subjects as well. Um, you have to get quite good grades um, and then you go to off to university. So this is a picture of the university I went to, which was the University of Bristol. And um, they had their own farm as well, which is where, where the, the picture of those cows there, um, which is and specifically I went to obviously the veterinary school, which is the middle picture that you can see there. Um, and it takes five years um, at university usually to, to train to become a vet. And uh, now that you are a vet, what sort of animals do you treat? So my initial, um, my first job when I first graduated from university was what's known as a mixed job. Um, so I was working with all creatures, great and small, quite literally. So I was working with dogs, cats, um, all small pets, so uh, guinea pigs, rabbits, uh, the occasional tortoise and also wildlife. So this duckling and this and the owl demonstrate that. I was also working with cows and sheep um, and horses and donkeys as well. Uh, but uh, these days, my second job, I just work with what are known as small animals. So that's uh, dogs and cats and, and other pets as well. So not the, not the large animal horses and, and farm animals. Lovely. And um, some, anim some vets do specialise in more exotic animals as well, don't they? That is true, yes. So um, although I get the occasional um, tortoise or uh, parrot brought to me, I'm not sort of by any means an, an, an expert in those species. Um, I prefer birds like chickens and ducks. Um, I, you know, I, I've, I've got quite a bit of experience with those, bizarrely, because I've um, kept them and looked after them myself for very many years, which has given me a lot of experience with those species. And, um, one of the uh, the other questions was, what's the stinkiest animal that you've ever had in the surgery? Um, so I think all animals, uh, to be quite honest, have the have the potential to be stinky. Um, what I would say, though, this picture demonstrates that all animals poo and all animal poo smells, whether that is cat, dog, horse, um, cow, pig, chicken, um, all types of animals poo and all types of animal poo smells. <laughs> Oh, um, and another question someone sent in was, how do you remember all of the pet illnesses? What equipment do you use to help with your diagnosis? So the first question, the first part of that question, how do I remember all of the pet illnesses? Well, um, that's impossible. You could never remember absolutely all the illnesses that all the different types of animals can get. So uh, first of all, you work usually in, in a practice that's got n multiple members of staff and um, each, each, each different vet will have different areas of expertise. So, for example, for me, I really like chickens. Um, I also like um, uh, breeding dogs as well. So um, if anyone has a question about puppy health or about um, a chicken, then they may come to me. But I don't know a lot about, for example, hearts 
Um, so I would go to someone with a, with a cardiology question and ask, ask them. Um, and there's various different specialists who we can ask advice of as well. Um, so the second part of that question is what, um, what equipment do we use to help um, with my diagnosis? So there's loads of different types of equipment. Uh, sometimes it's very simple, um, a thermometer, which unlike in uh, you children, um, it, it going in your ear or in your mouth, um, sadly an animal thermometer goes up an animal's bottom uh, to take a temperature. All the different species have different normal ranges of, of their temperature as well. Uh, we can also use a stethoscope, which is that instrument that's at the bottom right, um, which is for listening to chests and to hearts, and also to you can listen to uh, noises in the in the tummy as well with that with that instrument. Um, we can also use um, what's known as an ophthalmoscope, which is the instrument that's at the bottom left, which is for looking looking at eyes. Uh, it basically works by shining a light and there's a little camera lens within it as well so you can look at the back of an animal's eye. Um, and there's also what's known as an oroscope which, or an otoscope which basically is, is the same thing but it looks down ears so it shines a light into an ear and you can have a look down it that way. Um, and then the, the middle picture there is a, is a picture of an x-ray so we have to use tools and equipment to look at the inside of animals which we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So this is just an x-ray um, you can see that there's it's an x-ray of a dog, you can see part of its skull, part of its spinal column and its front legs and also its windpipe which is that long uh, black thing that's going from its um, from the top of its mouth all the way down into its chest and you can also see its uh, its heart and parts of its lungs in there as well so we have to use different tools to help us look at the inside of animals where we where we otherwise wouldn't be able to because sadly we aren't blessed with x-ray vision oh, and it looks like um along its leg it's got something in there as well i'm sure our ch children would like to know what that might be yeah, so that will be an, an intravenous cannula. So essentially what that is, is a, a little port that we would insert um, in, into an animal's vein to allow us to administer it um, at drugs. So, for example, drugs to make it go sleepy so that we could take the pictures, because unfortunately, unlike a person, we can't ask an animal to, to, to sit still whilst we're taking x-rays. So sometimes we have to give them different types of medications to make them um, go sleepy so they would stay still. It also enables us to put them on a drip as well so we can give them fluids if they aren't very well or if they're dehydrated. So uh, it would be much easier if animals could speak to us in real life then? It, it would make my job a lot easier if I was a real Dr Doolittle, yes, uh, because they'd be able to tell me what was wrong with them uh, and I would know exactly what to do for them as well. Uh, but a lot of this equipment does look like things that I might have seen when I've been to the doctors, so mm -hmm. um, I know that I've, they've definitely used the uh, ear piece of equipment uh, on me before. Mm -hmm. So you have some similar sort of equipment there. Yeah, so there's a lot of crossover because essentially um, animals just like humans are, are living things. They work in the same way and dogs and cats are, are quite similar to people in many ways. Um, obviously things like birds and, and reptiles are, are a bit different and have slightly different ways of working but you know every animal, most the vast majority, they've all got eyes, they've all got ears, they've got mouths, they've got stomachs and hearts so in essentially they work in very similar ways across various different species so it, there's a lot, lot of crossover between humans animal medicine and we use some of the same medications as well. Lovely and um, the last question that we've got is what is the most enjoyable part of your job? So I would say that the most enjoyable part of my job is um, de various different things but partly is working with an excellent group of people so uh, you can see there that there's the, the, one of my team members there that's Emma she's one of our veterinary nurses so having uh, good work colleagues is great so they can act as friends and give you support whilst you're at work as well if you're having a bit of a bad day because being a vet can be stressful and it can be emotional as well when you're dealing with poorly animals and, and upset owners um, but I'd also say another thing that I like is the variety and um, obviously quite a lot of the photos on the on this slide are pictures of dogs but you can see I have put the token chicken in there as well uh, you see all different types of animals and we're not just limited to one, one species as our as human medics are um, and the other thing is as well is that it's just so rewarding in that you know on se uh, several of all of these photos tell a story and all of them involve saving an animal's life and actually, when you put that into context, I can come home from work and I can say, hang on a minute, I saved an animal's life today. So 
And um, for example, that the big picture, which has got me in, and um, that's actually my own dog, that's Rosie, and she's giving blood. Uh, and that was to save a poorly patient by giving it a, a blood transfusion um, so that, you know, she, she could be treated and she has gone on to, to live a normal, healthy, happy life. Um, the picture on the top left, that little, uh, the brown puppy, um, he was a puppy, puppy that was called Paddington um, and he came in after um, his, 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 he hadn't been vaccinated yet and he became very, very poorly with a virus that causes severe diarrhea and vomiting in young puppies and he almost died but thanks to the treatment that we gave him um, he was able to survive. Um, the picture of the chicken there, that was a chicken called Emma, named after the, the, the veterinary nurse in that photo with me there. Um, that was a chicken that was brought into the surgery having, she'd um, unfortunately broken her leg. Um, and I decided to take the, the, that chicken home and, uh, and, and try and fix her. And we managed to do that. So she went on to, to live a normal, happy, healthy life that a chicken could live, scratching about in my garden and, and laying eggs as well, which was great. Um, and then looking at the lower two photos, um, the, 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 the little puppy on the left, that was a stray puppy. Um, she was actually abandoned at my surgery um, with a broken leg. Um, and uh, and we, we were able to fix that broken leg and, and rehome her to a new owner. And she, we received lots of different videos and photos of her on, ongoing progress. So she, she's living a, a healthy life as well. Uh, and then finally, those little center um, they were delivered by cesarean section so the mum couldn't give birth to them naturally so we had to help her by performing a surgery um, to, to deliver those puppies into the world so actually there were seven puppies in that litter so I've not only have me and the other guys who I work with saved one life of the mum but we've also saved seven lives from her puppies so what could be better than that? That does sound like a very very rewarding thing to to do. Um, and just out of curiosity, I know someone, uh, we haven't put the question up here, but someone was wondering how long it uh, takes for, for a dog's leg to heal if it's broken. I, I imagine it's a different amount of time to the chicken's leg. Yes, yeah, so it's, um, it is a different amount of time to the chicken's leg. So um, interestingly, bird bones heal very, very quickly. Um, so Emma, the chicken, her uh, leg was fixed in roughly about three weeks and um, was when she was able to sort of start putting weight on it again. I'm not quite sure why it is that bird bones heal so quickly. I think the metabolic rate is a lot quicker than dogs and cats, so that helps. Um, but and also with, do with dogs as well, it can vary a lot. So this puppy, her leg will have healed very, very quickly because she's young and her bones are still growing. So in older animals, it takes a longer amount of time. It also can depend on the nature of the, of the problem problem with the leg. So if it's a, a broken bone that's quite simple, if the bone is in just two pieces, then it's easier to fix and won't take quite so long. But if it's in many pieces, if it's been smashed up quite badly, then it can take an awfully long time to heal. But as a very, very rough guide, I would say as a minimum, you're looking at probably about six weeks on average. OK, well, Thank you very much. I'm sure our young people will be really interested in hearing all of your answers. Um, if any of them are interested in uh, becoming vets or finding out if they would like that sort of thing, I know we've talked about um, how they what they would study, but um, can you recommend that they would do work experience? Um, did that sort of thing help you as well? Yes, so um, doing lots of work experience is useful. It gives you an idea as to, as to what it's like being a vet. So, um, you know, you can go to different vet practices and get a direct experience of, of, of working in a, within a vet itself. But also there's lots of different things that you can do um, to just get different exposure to animals. So, for example, a, a boarding kennels or a cattery, going and asking farmers if you can work on their farm or get some experience on their farm. So, you know, um, we're working with cattle and sheep. Also, if, if you go horse riding or if you're interested in that, that's work exposure to animals as well. And then also the really sort of weird and wonderful things if you've got, you know, you, if you're able to go and do work experience at a wildlife rescue centre or at a zoo, um, then those are fantastic opportunity to find to, to find out what it's like working with animals. Uh, so thank you very much for coming along and uh, answering all of those questions. I'm sure the young people will be really interested in hearing your answers. Um, so thank you very much. Right, no problem. Thank you very much for having me.
Thank you very much for watching our assembly and thank you to the schools uh, participating in the Our Past Your Future project for sending in such fantastic questions. Also thank you to our special guest George Bracegirdle.